Okay, let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this morning. We just ask for your Holy Spirit to be here as we study together. Help us to understand where we are and where, what work you are planning to do uh, on this earth that we can participate in. And uh, help us to understand our disappointment. And we, we pray, Lord, that these mornings that we can spend uh, studying together will be a blessing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Actually, should plug in this other microphone. I'd probably get better sound. Does the sound sound different as soon as I plug in that microphone? Hugely different. Okay. A lot better. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, so, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, this study is um, we had the first part where we went through the book of Numbers, or, or Numbers chapter three, pardon me, dealing with the number 273, and show that that's established it as a symbol of the Levites. And it has to do with the redemption. There's this redemption money that is involved, and this redemption money is symbolic, and it, and it gives us the number uh, 1260. And, um, we also get there the number 300, so we get uh, the number of the priests as a symbol, however we want to look at that. And then we have the Levites, and then the Israelites symbolize Protestantism, which I use the term Nethanin uh, to refer to them. And, and that was basically the conclusion from the previous study. So if you haven't seen that study, I suggest that you watch it uh, to understand what I just said. Now, we're, we're moving to Acts 27, and actually we're going to start a study, uh, chapter 28, the verse, first 10 verses, and try to understand how that relates to Acts 27. And as many of you know, uh, anybody watching this may have seen presentations on Acts 27 and about the Levites. So this is about the Levites and the message to the Levites. Now, this is Paul's journey as he goes from Caesarea uh, to Rome, and it's, it's a journey by ship, uh, two different ships that he travels on. Um, it's pretty well established uh, now. Um, there's a lot of information that, has, uh, that we have now that people, you know, a couple of hundred years ago wouldn't have had as much information. We have detailed maps. We have uh, charts of the ocean, of the currents in the Mediterranean Sea. And the different winds and then we have all these different accounts um, of people who have done this trip and this journey and hit these types of storms that we're gonna see uh, that, that Paul experiences. I also read a lot of uh, critical scholarship uh, regarding Acts 27 uh, just in, in trying to get some of the background information and, and it's interesting that the critical scholarship accepts that this story uh, occurred uh, that it's actually from an actual account even though some of them don't believe it was this trip because the, of course they don't believe the Bible and they're always looking for flaws um, but they say that this has to be actual account uh, of a trip whether it, whether it was Paul's trip or somebody else's trip it's not something that could be manufactured and so people who have who sailed the Mediterranean say this is an actual account and of course we know that um, but it's interesting that there are some, some things that occur in this story that, that occur in a lot of shipwreck stories. Now, Stephen had uh, sent a paper where he, he, uh, he parallels this, where he sees some similarities uh, between uh, a storm that Ellen White was in. And we're going to look at that when we get to the storm part of it, because um, we're not going to get there today at all. Uh, we're just going to basically get through the first 12 verses. That's the plan. And, uh, but in, in this, this, what we're going to see that this is a, this journey of Paul's is typical. Um, so it's a type of something 
and, and there are some pretty strong evidences that we, we can see that it is. And that has to do with the names, uh, the numbers, um, uh, measurements, and, and just overall uh, the, the, the importance of all these details being there in the book of Acts. You know, you could just say, you know, just Luke had this story to tell and he just wrote this, this chapter to tell this story. Uh, but the details there, as we know, nothing in scripture is of any minor significance. And the details there yield some interesting results. And so you would have to say that it's, it's not chance that those details are there. And, and we know that, that we've done this with other stories and there's no reason why this story should be any different. Now, as far as the importance that this story had in this movement, Acts 27, is that this was presented by Tess, and it was something that brought her into the movement. Now, to be honest, looking back at, at some of the presentations, I'm not so sure why people were impressed by it. Um, maybe it had something to do with her presentation, that she looked like a little child, um, the sort of the way that she presented was the sort of rapid fire uh, presentation. And, and maybe it was just this, these, these types of uh, impressions, which would more be a sort of um, almost an artistic uh, attraction to what was happening or what she was saying rather than the content itself. And of course, there were some very interesting details that she would bring out that would impress people. But overall, when you look at it, it's very lacking in, in biblical support uh, the conclusions that she draws. They seem to be kind of speculative, very subjective. And, and I'm not a fan of that, right? So even, even with all the chronology that I've done, which is objective, I'm always leery about the interpretation of what something means. You know, unless I have really clear, uh, you know, thus saith the Lord, and I have lots of scriptures to support something, I'm not really inclined uh, to, to, give, to give an interpretation. But that's just me. You know, other people are, are, you know, maybe more inclined, maybe more inspired, maybe more able to see things that I can't see. But even if I see something, I generally don't trust it. Just because I see something, I'm going to question it. I'm going to work through it and try to understand it. Now, we have a lot of work to do on Acts 27. And and I have a lot of work to do still on it. I've, I've gotten much, even from yesterday, as I've read through materials again and again, I got a much better idea of what's actually happening. So the problem that we have is we know this is a journey, and this journey typifies uh, something. And it typifies, uh, for different people, different, different aspects. You could start it at different places. You could put it on a line, uh, and which we're going to do as we go through this story uh, we're going to get it eventually that it's on a line and try to understand it as a reform line. Now, in, in order to do that, there's so much detail here and, and so many different directions that it can go. It's almost like being in a storm of knowledge where the winds could blow us almost any direction and we have to make sure that we're on course. Now, um, this, this paper that I gave you uh, that's rather pretentious, um, he, has, uh, he has all these diagrams, which are very useful. And, and they're useful not because of the detail that's in them, even though he's an amazing detail. Uh, why they're, they're useful is he, you, you can visually get an idea of at least the scope of what he's trying to do. And, and, and that to me was helpful. Now, in a sense, we're kind of doing the same thing that he is, is we're, we're, we're taking this and we're saying that it represents some period of time. And the question is, what period of time? And as, as we go through this, we should be able to see that we could zoom in uh, and apply it in different places in different times. Now, I, I want to go to his first one. It's stone one. So he has this, uh, these 12 stones uh, that he uses um, in this study. And uh, on, I'm going to bring this up so people can see it. Put it up 
Let's see. Let's see here. Um, now, it really starts in page four of his book, and, and we'll look at the diagrams as well. So he just tells you the charts one and two, stone one and two, were drawn from the last two chapters of the book of Acts. Um, so he is actually using uh, Acts 27 and, and then 28 up to verse 10. So he, he looks at that as a unit, and that's what we're going to study in these next, uh, this in the next three studies. Um, and in parallel with the seven letters recorded in the book of Revelation, sent to the seven churches in Asia. So, of course, that's a history of the Christian church. And that's where he is primarily uh, drawing his, his line, is that he's starting at 34 AD, and he's going to go up to the end of time. That's, that's his application of that. Now, now, he talks about that the final act is the day of the Lord. And, you know, this is a phrase that has been used in this message by different groups and different people. And there's always this huge emphasis upon this, this phrase. Um, and Elder Jeff has dealt with errors uh, regarding different applications of the day of the Lord. Now, I'm not really quite sure how I apply the day of the Lord. It's one of those things that I've never really, uh, I've never had any solid opinion about, um, even though Jeff has, has applied it in at different times and other people have. It seems to me to be a much more general idea than a very specific time. Um, so, you know, so there, you know, that's where maybe I differ with some people. I don't think that we, you know, to say the final act is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord to me is just the time in which the Lord is working and it can apply to different times. So I, I don't believe that it just applies to one time. So if anybody has any comments on that about the day of the Lord, um, you know, I'd be happy to look, you know, to listen to that comment or any ideas about it. Now, he says the last events can be better understood by charts two, four, and five. So uh, as they began to unfold from the year 1989, uh, with the last call at 9-11-2001, uh, so September 11, to the people of God from Revelation 18, verse 1, 2, and 4. So there's some ideas in here, of course, we would be f very familiar with. Uh, he's going to do some odd things. Uh, when Jeff sent this out, he said that this paper contains a lot of mistakes. Um, and, and I think he wasn't meaning typos. I think he was meaning that the, the guy has a lot of uh, mistakes in logic, uh, mistakes in information and facts. So it's not really a reliable paper. In that <laughs> um, bless you, dear. Um, now, he talks about the difference between prophecy and the principle of type and anti-type. So, um, and, and I think this is maybe, you know, a good point. Obviously, we know what a Bible prophecy is. You know, uh, the prophecies of Daniel, uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel. But prophecies also become types. That is, as they're fulfilled, the, event, the events that they, that they mark, those can then be typical of something that happens at the end. So we don't reapply prophecy. And we really have no prophecies our time prophecies, at least, in on our time. We have obviously lots of prophecy. But we're in the Day of Atonement. And, um, you know, and in some ways you can say that that's the Day of the Lord, you know, from October 22nd, 1844 to the end of the world, if you wanted to. Or you could narrow it down in some other ways. Uh, but one of the things he says here, which is, of course, not him saying it, Second Peter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed that as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. And if you look at that passage and you read the verses before it, um, Peter talks about how uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, they saw Elijah and Moses. So they saw the kingdom of God and that they actually had touched Christ. And, and so he says, we experienced all these things. We saw things, but he says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. And, and this is an important point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at these verses here. Uh, because one of the things that, you know, keeps coming to my mind as we go through uh, this study, as I go through it, and I think we'll see it clearly, is we want to have a certainty and assurance uh, that God is leading us. Um, 
It's check second Peter, right? Yeah. Um, so he says here, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So this is the Mount of Transfiguration uh, when this, this voice was heard. So they heard that when uh, Jesus was standing with Moses and Elijah. But he says, then we also have a more sure word of prophecy. So the prophecy is a more sure word than actually uh, seeing things with your eyes, uh, experiencing these things. Being eyewitnesses is not as powerful. And then he, he says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is, is of any private interpretation. Now, people misuse this passage all the time. They think that private interpretation means when you have some unique view that only you have. So let's say you're studying the scriptures and you come to see something that nobody's ever seen before, and then you share it, and somebody says, well, that's a private interpretation because other people weren't shown that. But that's not what it's talking about. If you look at the next, next verse, it tells you what that means. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That is, in order for to, to understand the prophecy of Scripture, because these men who wrote it were inspired by the Holy Ghost to write it, you need the Holy Ghost in order to interpret it. A private interpretation would be a human interpretation apart from the Holy Spirit. Even if you're the only person who interprets something that way on the planet Earth, if the Holy Spirit has shown it to you, it's not a private interpretation. And, and so people throw this around as an epithet, some way in which you, know, they, you, can, you can disparage somebody who makes an interpretation of Scripture. But what you have to, what the person really has to ask themselves is can you show it through the scriptures. And, and always I you know, ask the question is not who, who says something or anything even about, about, about that person. The, all, the question we should always ask about something that we hear is, is it true? doesn't matter who presents it or who accepts it. The idea is, is it true? And the only way that we can know that it's true is by looking at the sure word of prophecy. Now, the sure word of prophecy then includes, of course, prophecies, but it also includes all of Scripture. So, we, you know, you can't really separate those things. I know, I know some of this is really basic ideas, but I think this is what we really have to answer when it comes to, to this story. Um, I should have actually just switched back to, to this and just switched to this. Paper. Now I want to look at uh, stone number one here. So hopefully this is kind of hard to see. I know it's uh, not as zoomed in as other things are. Maybe if I get rid of that, that doesn't really help too much. I can zoom in a bit more. Okay, so what he's done here is the history of God's church on earth. And he set up the churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then he puts this eighth, the church triumphant. And, and this idea um, Jeff has presented um, to some degree that we have these seven churches and then we have this church, the church triumphant, um, which is really of the seven. And if we're gonna say which church it is, we could argue that it's Philadelphia, the Laodicea, um, which is the time in which we're in, at some point it ends. Now, he has all these markings of these dates, which I wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, 
Thyatira, for instance, would go from 538 to 1798. So he, he, put, he divides the, that period of 1260 into two different periods, which I wouldn't do. And Sardis would begin in 1798. And Philadelphia would be the church from uh, 1840 uh, to 44 or to 50 maybe, but you know, it's that period of time. It's the Millerite history of that wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And it continues uh, into the point where uh, the church becomes Laodicea, which would be 1851, maybe 1850, somewhere in there. So he has these things, which when, when Jeff says that, you know, that has mistakes, I would think that those are some of them, how he divides the seven churches is not anything that I've ever seen, um, which doesn't mean it's wrong, but there's really good reasons why we, we mark the churches the way that we do. And, and Sardis, which, which has this red stone, uh, we know it's after 1798. It's this light that comes from the unfolding of light after the period of darkness, and then the church of brotherly love. So, so you know, you can see in these details, obviously there's lots of mistakes, but we can see that this idea that um, you know we have this this line uh, of the church and and there's focus upon the church triumphant now I would also argue that the idea of the church triumphant is um, the church triumphant doesn't care, carry any weeds and weed and tares and and here when he puts it in 2014 I think is it's pretty strange um, because that's actually when the church begins to separate or this message begins to separate. Uh, so we have all these people leaving and he, you know, I, I just have a real hard time with this idea of the church triumphant and how people were interpreting it, uh, especially the new movement. And, and so this wouldn't really fit with any of my thinking. Now he, he has again taken this and he zoomed into, um, uh, you know, zoomed into that latter part there of Philadelphia Laodicea Church Triumphant, and he's given us some more information. And, and there again, he's, he's done stuff with the generations that isn't correct. He starts the first generation in 1863. Now, Jeff starts it in, in 1798. I started in 1844. Um, that's the way I look at it, uh, based upon my understanding, which we talked about last time, having to do with the time of the end. and and, and where the fourth generation is um, in, in the previous history. And then the failure that actually happens after 1844, again, starts as a first generation. So the failure, uh, the, the arrival of the first generation would start earlier, is all I'm saying. And, and then we would have the second generation, 1888 to 1919, that would be correct, third to 1957. And then the fourth generation continues. It doesn't end in 1989. We're still technically in the fourth generation. It's just that in 1989, we have a time of the end with an increase of light. And, and then, of course, he's going to introduce the Song of Solomon, 6 verse 10. So I just want to look at what he's doing here. And, and so, again, this isn't going to be a comprehensive study of his material, but just some of the general ideas and how people... Uh, can look at it. And, and this verse, I actually wrote a scripture song on this one. Um, uh, so it says, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? And um, so we know that this is referring to uh, the church. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's how he's ap applying this. But there's, there's a lot more to this. Um, in, when you, I guess I have a particular um, interest in the Song of Solomon. One is I did a scripture song album of the Song of Solomon. And I have my own understanding of the Song of Solomon that differs quite a bit from uh, what people usually see. And that's because I studied it pretty in depth. Uh, and this was a long time ago. So this would have been in... Uh, well, it'd be almost uh, 27 years ago, so quite a while ago that I studied the Song of Solomon in depth. Uh, but the interesting thing about the Song of Solomon is that the Shulamite 
is actually Solomon. It's just a feminine form of the name Solomon. You'll see that in verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamit. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What shall we see in the Shulamite, as it were, a company of two armies, or Mahanei is that two armies there. And return, that's the word shuv. You know, it means uh, like when they returned uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem from Babylon, right? That word, uh, which is the going forth of the commandment to restore. That word restore is the same word here as return. Shuv in Hebrew. And Shulamite is just the feminine form of Solomon. And, and the book is in a chiastic structure. It actually starts, everything is the positive sense, uh, moving up to the wedding, which is, uh, you know, the highlight of the book near the center. And then everything from the wedding onwards is reversed, but in a negative sense. Uh, so you have this positive thing moving up to the wedding, and then you have this wedding, and then you have this negative like, experience. And so when he introduces uh, Solomon in here, and he just takes this one verse and tries to apply it to the church triumphant, um, there's actually a lot more going on. And, and so people have, have misused the Song of Solomon, in my view, in, in trying to apply it prophetically. And I've read books that other people, Adventists, have written trying to interpret the Song of Solomon. And again, it's one of those subjective things. People are just making these willy-nilly assertions without really strong scriptural support. They just see something and they think it's true because they see it. And, and that's not really a good reason. So I just bring that up. Again, it's almost an aside, but it's kind of the underlying uh, theme as we're going through Acts 27, is that we don't want to be just interpreting things. We want to have some kind of scriptural basis for this. Um, so let's, let's go back to uh, this. I should have just done it this way. Yeah, so here is that, again, this diagram so we can see um, how this is operating. Now, I want to go to uh, stone four, stone two. And this is pretty small. Um, now, he introduces this idea, um, which we're going to have to look at. So in stone one, go back to his paper, um, he's, he's going to, you know, obviously look at, let's just read this paragraph here at the bottom. What day would the Apostle Peter be here referring to? Without doubt, the day of the Lord. And see, and, and, and there's where you see somebody just makes this leap. Without doubt. Um, but I don't see when it says to the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. And he says that this is without doubt referring to the day of the Lord. And then he says this day, a prophetic Sabbath, is in fact a period of time, 2001 to the second advent of Jesus Christ, which will begin to be fulfilled when the day star, or the morning star, Jesus Christ is born in the hearts of his servants, the prophets, priests, at the end of the year. 1225-2021, uh, the mystery of godliness, which is in Christ, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory will be fulfilled. And see, I can't accept that kind of reasoning. Uh, just because somebody says without doubt, um, that's not a reason to, to just accept what they say. And, and to me, the whole thing is just mere speculation. There's no basis other than wishful thinking on the, on the part of the writer. And I'm not trying to be hard on him. I'm just saying that this is often what people do. And he's going to use some verses where he talks about his spirit on the Lord's day. And we know that's the Sabbath. Uh, it's not talking about the day of the Lord in, in a prophetic sense. And, and so he refers to these things there. And now he's going to refer to us to some of the verses here in Acts 27 verse 1. Um, and it was determined that we should sail into Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners, one named Julius and a centurion of Augustus's band. Uh, he was a centurion of Augustus's band. So he's going to say some things here, and I just want to read some of his thinking. Paul's journey to Rome, narrated by the Apostle Luke, begins with the Apostle Paul being delivered, along with some prisoners, to a centurion of the Augustus regiment. 
Paul, as we can understand as the biblical narration progresses, is a type of Jesus Christ. That is, he symbolically represents the person of Jesus in the context of the type. Now, I've thought a lot about this. One of the things that I had a really hard time with, and I even put it in, in some of my papers of what Tess taught, but she, she tries to, um, and he is doing the same thing, is they take these people, uh, Aristarchus, uh, Luke, and Paul, and they, they give them these symbolic representations here. Christ, um, in this case with Paul, um, Aristarchus, I believe, being the father, and then um, Luke being the Holy Spirit. And, and, you know, there's a sort of logic that can be seen there. Luke is the one who's writing, so he could represent the Holy Spirit, um, because the Holy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Aristarchus means um, um, it has to do with being a ruler, so God is a ruler. And then Paul, just his, uh, his, his, the person of Paul and how he's working and operating, we could compare to Christ. So, so I've thought about that a little bit, and I, and I think there's maybe some merit in it on, on a certain level. But I, I don't know if we could, we could make an argument, really, that Paul is Christ in this story. Um, you know, Paul is being delivered to Rome as a prisoner, and, and I don't see how that parallels in any way. So, you know, maybe on one level you could sort of imply it, but you can't take the whole story as being that way. And, and, and so that, that's, you know, to me it's just too much speculation. And as we, we try to go through this, uh, we'll see these types of things if we're, if we're going to look at these applications. And we have to get these things in our mind as we start to go through this story, because we're going to get through the first 12 verses, if I can get through this introduction. Um, so we're going to read through these. You know, wasted way too much time, I think, talking. Um, now, we know there's certain other prisoners. So some of these people on the ship are prisoners. Um, and, and we know that uh, Paul and Aristarchus are both prisoners in this case, because he's Aristarchus is a fellow prisoner. And then, of course, Luke is just there uh, with Paul. So he's not a prisoner. He's not, uh, uh, you know, he's not in charge with the crime. Now, we're going to start looking at these verses. So I, I'm not going to go through his own, whole interpretation. And I know many of you have re read them. So let's go to... Uh, this passage yeah. so I'm, I might not get through all this today I'll have to finish some of this uh, first section uh, tomorrow and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy they delivered Paul and, us and certain other prisoners unto one. Now, they shouldn't have put the word one there because you would put that there if you're actually introducing somebody that hasn't been introduced, but he's already been introduced earlier in Acts chapter 26, I believe. Um, so he's a Macedonian. Um, uh, or, or pardon me, not, no, I'm getting mixed up here. Never mind. That's, that's a different point. I, I'm, when we get to Aristarchus, so this is one named Julius. So this is, that one is there fine. So when you're introducing someone in English, uh, you can put the word once. The one there is, is implied. One named Julius is centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. And then it says one Aristarchus. So he's introduced in chapter 26. A Macedonian, and it just says Aris, the, uh, Aristarchus the Macedonian, of Thessalonica being with us. So anyway, we have this, they enter into this ship. Um, now this is a, a ship, basically, uh, the way that this works is there are these ships that are constantly moving along the coasts, transporting people. Uh, we could think of them like a shuttle. So this is what they first get into. They get into the ship, and, and they know that they have to get onto another ship uh, later in order to get to Rome, because these ro this ship is a coastal ship. Uh, so it doesn't go out into the open 
a Mediterranean Sea, which you would need to, to get to Rome. I mean, you could kind of work your way all along the coast um, in, in these types of ships if you wanted to, uh, I would assume. I haven't done it myself, but um, I would think that they're trying to get the most direct route to get there the quickest is the idea. Um, and the next day we touched at Sidon. So they traveled about uh, 67 miles uh, in that day. So in one day, which is pretty good, which meant they had a, a good uh, wind and the ocean currents that were also favorable as well, which they generally are in that direction. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Um, so Paul has this freedom uh, to, to go about the ship. And, and, and in my, my mind, it, it seemed like when they, they touched down at Sidon, it's almost like they allowed him to, uh, to actually visit people who had maybe even come on the ship uh, to, to, to greet Paul. I'm not certain of that. But definitely, Paul is, is free. And now there are some things that we could look at it as an interpretation here. So we've, we've already sort of uh, looked at this to some degree, that this is a journey that's typical. But here it says, uh, refresh himself. And I think of you know, the refreshing, the Holy Spirit. And uh, so Paul has this freedom at this time, and the Holy Spirit is being poured out at this, at this time, that there is a refreshing that occurs in, in the beginning of this journey. Um, so we have freedom and we have this ability to refresh himself. And, and so we could look at that, if we're gonna look at this as the journey dealing with the church and starting in the first centuries, you know, the white horse, um, uh, the church of Ephesus, we know that there's this period of time in which there's this freedom and this liberty of through the Holy Spirit, not the liberty necessarily from persecution, but definitely liberty in Christ, uh, especially when you consider what had happened being under the Jews. Now, um, in verse 4, And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So, so now what this, this boat has to do is it has to, um, uh, the winds start to, to go against it. So you have a, a a west wind blowing against you and 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 it says sailing under Cyprus so I, I'm gonna show you some maps and, and these are helpful so we'll go I think I get rid of that one so I actually had sent you an email and I seem to have Closed some of my pages. So. Well, while I'm waiting for that to open, I'm going to show you Google Earth, and it needs to be reloaded. I actually had my it frees up a little while ago, so everything's got to reload here. So this is the area, once I uh, share this, I guess I could have just done a new share. Okay, we'll just do this. Um, so this is the area that we're talking about, uh, the Mediterranean. And um, he's going to actually start down here. Um, in, in Israel, um, in Cyprus, or not Cyprus, Caesarea, and he's going to be traveling up this coast. Now, what they, they could try to do is they could try to cut across here and because they want to get over to Italy, right? So Italy is way over in this section, um, way over here. So obviously, at, at some point, you've got to get across the Mediterranean, underneath Greece, and over to Italy. So there's, there's the boot there, right? And now when it says they sailed under Cyprus, my initial thought was that they're going to go underneath this way. But actually, this is the leeward side of Cyprus, if you have west winds. 
And, and all of the maps are gonna show them going up around here. And, and of course this makes more sense. They're gonna stay closer to the coasts. And, and where they're finally gonna end up um, is over here somewhere where they're gonna get a new ship. Um, I do wanna show you that map. So I, I put a link in it here. So this is the map. So you can see this here. And over here by Lycia, the city of Myra, uh, that's where they're gonna get to a grain ship. So you can see down here, they're starting at Caesarea Marti Maritima. It's the name of the place. It doesn't specifically say that, but that's assumed. And you can see it's, it's, it's a little bit in the northern side of uh, Israel here. And then they sail to Sidon. And then after Sidon, they're going to have to sail on the leeward side of Cyprus. And, and then eventually they're going to change ships over here. So in, in trying to understand this journey, you know, you may say, well, why do we need to know all this detail? Well, I think there's a lot of symbolism that's going to be applied. And some of this we're going to come back and look at later on once we get some of this picture in our mind of what this means. Um, we know there's, there's going to be the ship of Alexandria. There's going to be eventually a storm. And that storm is going to bring them over to the Isle of Malta. And, that, and that's really where we're going to finish this story. So we're not going to get all the way to Rome in this story um, as an illustration. <clears throat> um, so they sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, the city, a city of Lycia. And there a centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Now this is a grain ship, so it's, it's you might call it a freighter. It's something that's going to be carrying a, a large amount of grain. And the reason why it's coming from Alexandria is that Egypt is the breadbasket of Rome. And, and they constantly have these, these journeys from Egypt to Rome. And in Rome, the Roman Empire is actually responsible for feeding everybody. Um, and people, if, not, if they're not getting their food, they're going to be a bit unruly. So he actually has um, ships traveling in the winter, which of course is dangerous, but they're, they're guaranteed uh, an income. If they lose their ship, they in a sense have a type of insurance that they will, they will um, get uh, reimbursed for their losses. So it's kind of interesting this way. And that's one of the reasons we're gonna see later on when they, uh, the, the, the person running the ship, operating the ship, wants to continue on. They get really a bonus. If they can get through at that time of year, you're actually going to get paid a lot more money than if you were just traveling in good weather. So, so there's kind of this incentive for people to take risks um, in, in traveling at this time of year because of the money that they can make. So, so there's some interesting details uh, regarding that, that that are important so they find the ship of alexandria so it's a grain freighter and they get put on that now and these these grain freighters will be pretty large as we're going to see there's going to be 276 people all told on board the ship that's a pretty big ship um, you know for those days uh, so it's not it's not a little ship now of course you have crew but you also have other people traveling because uh, this is a main way to travel. And we know we also have other prisoners as well. So a lot of these would be merchants traveling, um, even just citizens traveling for all different types of reasons. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens nigh unto where was the city of Lacia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. 
Now here, when, when they, they get through this, uh, and I will I'll be able to do this now, so going back to this map again. Um, so they're gonna get all this way over to Crete. Now when they sail under Crete here, you can see it's under in the sense this way. And they use that term to refer to basically being um, where the wind is coming against them. So the wind here is going to be a, nor a west northwest wind. Uh, and that's why they're sailing on that side. And so you can see they went up to Snidus, which is this little uh, place here, just on the tip of Asia. And then they went down to Sal Salamone. If you can see that, it's pretty tiny. Maybe I can blow this up. That's, I guess that's as big as I can get it doing this. And then you can see they get to the Fair Havens here. And this is the Isle of Crete. And we have uh, Ellen White's account of this as well. And I'm just going to So I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit. That's not where I want to be. It's another place. I'll do that next time. We'll actually look at uh, that section next time. Uh, but anyway, here when she deals with this um, the voyage and the shipwreck, um, she, she doesn't deal much with the beginning part of it here. But we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni. At Fair Havens, they were compelled to remain for some time waiting for favoring winds. Winter was approaching rapidly. Sailing now was dangerous, and those in charge of the vessel had to give up hope of reaching their destination before the season for travel by sea should be closed for the year. The only question now to be decided was whether to remain at Fair Havens or attempt to reach a more favorable place in which to winter. Yeah, I don't have this very big for you to look at. So you might have a hard time seeing that tiny print. I have to figure out how to make this bigger. There must be a simple way to do it. Anyway, I'll get, get out of that. Go back here. So now Paul here is not talking uh, from something that he was given by the Holy Spirit or in vision. He's just talking from common sense. But as I said, the reason why they're going to press on is if they can get to Italy, and you can see they've already gone half the journey by the time they get to Fair Havens. Um, if they can get to Italy, you know, before things, you know, in, in this trip, before they, if they don't have to stay over, over longer, that costs money. So they're always thinking about money and that's what the ship, the captain of the ship is really thinking about. I want to get to Italy. I want to get my bonus. I want to get, maybe that's home, you know? So there's lots of motivations why people are going to take these risks. Now, of course, the idea is that they can get to some other port as well. So they're at Fair Havens, and it's, it's not the best port to be in uh, to winter over. So they actually want to get to uh, Phoenix. So you can see that this is where they at least hope to get to, is to Phoenix. So let's, uh, let's go back to the passage there. Um, And, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, and I'm not really sure what that would be referring to. Maybe it just wasn't a luxurious port. I don't know. Um, and the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice, well, that's Phoenix, and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Now, um, just going back to this map then. Um, so when it says to the southwest and northwest, I'm not sure what they mean because those seem to be opposite to op southwest and northwest. I'm not sure if anybody has an idea of, of what that would mean. It, it lies to the southwest, maybe to the southwest of Italy and the northwest of them. And that would make sense. Um, but you can see it's still here on the island of Crete. Now, just to look at Crete here in Google Earth, um, 
you know, they have all these Greek names of everything. Uh, but the area that they want to get to is over here. And they're now over here at some port. So I wish I knew how to read what these, I mean, these are modern names of places. I'm not familiar enough with them. But if you look at this other map, uh, uh, we can see here, so this is not the best map to look at. Um, doesn't really show us too much detail. So we know that it's somewhere down here where this port is. And they want to get to a port up here and probably in, in this area here. So this would probably be uh, the harbor that they would be going to based on looking at this picture. Anyway, so there's a lot of details there. Maybe I'm getting too much detail about this, but I'm really trying to get the background information uh, so we can get it in our minds. And, you know, if we go back to here, um, in, into this guy's notes, So he says here, and this is kind of an interesting paragraph. He says here, it is also necessary to highlight in very important, a very important detail. Throughout this biblical narration, Acts 27, verse 28, 1 to 10, the ship which Apostle Paul is traveling makes some seemingly random stops. However, these stops uh, are the fulfillment of certain periods of time. So this is what he's, he's making this argument for, is that these are periods of time that are being referred to. And I would argue that he's correct on this. The point is what periods of time, and he's saying, well, these are according to chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, so the message is to the seven churches. Um, now, he says here, the passage, and we put out to sea, indicates that the church of God would now be established among the Gentiles, since the sea, waters, prophetically means peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And, and I think if you're going to at least parallel Paul to Paul, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And we know that um, as a person, it was his, from 34 AD, when he was at the stoning of Stephen, he is then uh, becomes converted shortly after that, and he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And so we can look at this journey of Paul as actually typical of Paul's experience to some degree, at least at the start of this. Um, so you could probably, Paul, if he was studying this, he was studying his experience of what he was going through, maybe he was even realizing there was some symbolism related to his life or his ministry. And this is just at the end of his ministry that he can look back and see that, this, that what he went through, all these different trials, typifies what um, he experienced in actual fact in his life. So he talks a bit about this, the fact that the Church of God establishes itself among the Gentiles is confirmed by the stoning of Stephen, and that took place in 34 AD. So that's where he's, why he's starting there in 34 AD. This is an important date that will, that, will sign it, um, that will sign it in a turning point, or sign it a turning point in the history of the people of God, since it is from this happening that the gospel would be taken to the Gentiles after the conversion of Paul. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for the salvation unto the ends, for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So, you know, there are some compelling reasons to take this, this narrative as referring to that. Now, he says here, um, uh, where he talks about they touched down at Sidon, and that Paul is given this liberty to go to, among, to his friends and refresh himself. It says, after a day of travel, so they arrived the next day, they took the stop over in Sidon after they left Caesarea. This verse indicates the end of the first period of the Church of God on earth. The trip from Caesarea to Sidon in the antitype context corresponds to the period of 34 AD to 97 AD. Here it should be said that a literal day or a set of literal days symbolizes a certain period of time 
which in this case refers to the time covered by the church of Ephesus. So you see what he's doing, and this is not illogical, right? Uh, we have this day, so they, they travel this day, and they travel the period of uh, 67 miles. Um, so, you know, in, in trying to, oops, my computer is shutting down, my one that I'm sharing with. I don't know why I did that. So I can't see. Okay. Somehow, my my, for some reason, uh, Google just shut down. So I'm gonna have to open it up again. That's all. So we will. Sorry about that. I don't know why that happened. It does that sometimes, but it's a, I think it's because Google Earth and all these different programs take up so much uh, power. But let's go back here. Okay. <clears throat> so this, this idea that we can take this literal day or even a set of literal days symbolizing a certain period of time. Now the question is what period of time are they gonna symbolize and how are we gonna apply those? Now I do wanna make a note that's interesting here. We have this person, Julius, who's of, of the band of Augustus or of Augustus's band. One of the things I notice about Julius and Augustus is that's the name of two months, July and August, um, which you know, I, I, is something that refers to time. And we're gonna see these references uh, to symbolic time in that way. Some people might think that's a stretch. Maybe that's really subjective. But uh, the time that they're traveling, uh, when, when we look at this journey, we, we're not given every single uh, day. So we know that there's going to be a period of 14 days that's going to be mentioned from the time that the storm, storm begins. But I would think that they would have been traveling uh, probably in September uh, when they first start their journey. We know that it's going to be uh, after the Day of Atonement, uh, when uh, they, they make this decision uh, regarding, uh, so that's going to be in October. Uh, October 5th, I think, is the Day of Atonement, if this is AD uh, 59. I'm not sure. I've been trying to figure out if I can nail down specifically what year this is. I haven't done that yet. I think it's AD 60. You AD 60 is what you have? Okay. And, and what's your base? Well, there's a, an Elamite comment about uh, Paul. Um, he's, he, he's in prison, Chrysoras in Italy for two years. Okay. And then he's in prison. And then he gets out just before Nero begins his persecution. Okay. And Nero begins his persecution in, in AD 64. Okay. So that means Paul would have to be released probably around 63. Okay. And then, uh, so two years before that, that means his house arrest in Rome began in AD 61. And okay. so therefore, he spent the winter then in Malta. So that would have been AD 60. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So 59 was close. I mean, maybe sometimes it's, it's hard to tell specifically because there's a lot of little details, but yeah, that makes sense. So if I go to AD 60, um, we would end up with, uh, now of course there's a problem here when you deal with AD 60 because the rabbinic calendar and the biblical calendar differ. So, uh, but we would use the biblical calendar here. And so they actually have October 22 uh, on the Gregorian and October 24th on the Julian in is the Day of Atonement in AD 60. 
where if you move it one year earlier, oops, I shouldn't have done it that way, it's going to move quite a bit earlier. So that would have been October, well, October 6th on the Julian and October 4th on the Gregorian. So, yeah, so if it, it would be a bit later in the year if it was according to the, being the year AD 60. So. Ellen White, she says that the, uh, the storm occurred in November. Okay. As well, so, so that, still soccer. Uh, so that would be AD 60 then. And I think the, it happened, yeah. And, and this is also a good argument for the biblical calendar then, because if you look at the rabbinic calendar, they're going to put it a month earlier, and, and you wouldn't have... You wouldn't even talk about the Day of Atonement being over if it, if it had been over for a month. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Right. So, so that fits in. So AD 60 fits. So that now we have the year, thanks to Stephen here, his research. And, um, and we have evidence of the biblical calendar over the rabbinic calendar. And the difference, for anybody watching, is just that some... Uh, the, the biblical calendar always starts after the spring equinox. The rabbinic calendar can start as much as two weeks before the spring equinox, uh, sometimes as early as March 6th or 7th. So very early, which wouldn't be conducive in any year uh, to the barley harvest working. So, um, I mean, you'd have to have a really early spring. Uh, for the bar har barley harvest to work that way. If you use the equinox, you never have to worry about the barley harvest. And, and so we've I've reverse engineered the biblical calendar from looking at all the, the chronology and all the dates in the Bible and comparing events and, and days of the week and so forth. And so we can discern that the biblical calendar in starting after the spring equinox is the most likely interpretation of the biblical calendar. And here it would fit in. So the rabbinic calendar would put you having uh, uh, September 23rd as the Day of Atonement in AD 60. Uh, but here we would have uh, the storm in November, and the Day of Atonement would have, have been about a week or so before uh, the beginning of November, so November 20, October 22nd. So that would fit in perfectly with the account here of the biblical calendar and it being AD 60 and the death of Nero, and all these other details that Stephen talked about. So thanks for that. That was very helpful. It saved me a lot of work. Um, now, uh, these next verses we're going to look at, and we'll just follow here what he's saying in this first part. After putting out from there, we sailed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were contrary, and we had sailed off the open sea. And so he, he looks at this and he tries to put this into this period of the Church of Smyrna, which he chooses 97 AD to 313. 313 is acceptable. 97 AD, some people put 100 AD. Um, now, so this would, of course, the winds being contrary would be a time of opposition and persecution against the church. It was already felt with some intensity. Now, we're still looking at his application. I think that we can zoom in, and we can apply this to this movement, but we're not going to do that yet. We're going to do that more as we, we go on uh, and further. So he's going to use this as the whole time of the church, uh, but I'm going to uh, make this application to be more about this movement. And, and you'll see why. And this will go back to our study yesterday on um, Numbers chapter 3. But, but taking this here, at least as a template, we can see that this makes sense, that this is the winds being contrary would refer to a time of opposition. Um, and he has some verses here where he par parallels this to the second church. Um, so we know that they, that they are the church that is being persecuted, uh, those initial persecutions uh, that happened in that history. The arrival at Myra indicates the end of the Smyrna period and the beginning of the next period. The next period would completely change the direction of the Church of God on earth. The gospel would be corrupted and altered, the foundations of the law of God. The divine principles that are grounded in love for others would then be replaced by an authoritarian human concept of law. Now, 
as, as, as much as I don't really have problems with what he said, I don't know if you could just make it as clear cut as that, but let's just accept that that's true. We do know that that's a change. So this is a mingling of paganism uh, with Christianity that occurs after these periods of persecution. And that's because there's this acceptance by Rome, Eastern Rome, specifically Constantine, um, of Christianity. And so persecution is actually a better environment uh, for Christianity than is um, uh, a, a, a period of freedom uh, where, where you're accepted. Now, and we can see that this, you know, if we're going to apply this, which I would, not just to this movement, we could apply it on a smaller scale to Adventism um, in the four generations. And that's one of the things that we can see here. If we're looking at this history of I would apply this probably more to the four generations of, ad, of, of, of history, the first four parts, and then I would apply it to Adventism in their four generations, rather than to try to take the whole thing from the beginning to the end. Even though I think you can do what he's doing. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just saying that um, uh, there's other ways to look at it. And, and so we have to try to decide what scale it is that we're going to look at this this uh, story in the book of Acts. So the first indicates a period where the Church of God began to be mingled with paganism. The change exchange of one ship, Adramidium, to another, Alexandria, symbolized the entrance of pagan traditions and forms within the church. And this is this is logical, right? And and this isn't much different than what Tess was saying. Um, this is kind of a logical thing. The symbolism of Alexandria is this educational system, and you could see how we could apply this to the Adventists if we're going to be looking at the third generation, 1919. We could definitely see the parallel there. And that's, that's where I'm primarily placing this, uh, this history. For me, it's much more powerful and much more clear if we address it as being Adventism. So Alexandria symbolizes the entrance of the pagan traditions and forms within the church. The church, paganized from now on, is symbolized by the boat of Alexandria. Alexandria was one of the main cities of Egypt that symbolically represents paganism. On the other hand, the city where the exchange of ships takes place is also significant. Myra was the city of Lycia, a city of Lycia where, the temple, where it was the temple of the Nicolaitans, a fact confirmed by the letter sent to the church at Pergamos. Now, I have a bit of a problem with some of this here. If you're saying that the church is now symbolized by the boat of Alexandria, we, we would have to argue that the church that is paganized is not the Christian church, but it's the Catholic church. And it's actually separate from the true, true church. And, and this is a misunderstanding of the messages to the seven churches. When we look at the messages to the seven churches, these are the messages to God's true people from the time of Christ, or from the stoning of Stephen, maybe, if you want to put it there, up until the second coming. And they, are, they may be in the world, and they may be in contact with these other churches, like the Catholic Church, but it's not a story about the Catholic Church. Uh, the messages to the seven churches is a story about God's true church. Now, they may be influenced by the Catholic Church because of what's happening around them, but if you're going to look at, their, at the church as a boat or a journey on a boat, the church is not pagan, right? The, the, the true Christians are not paganized. The Catholic church is paganized, um, and, and, and popular Christianity, let's say, is paganized at that time. But the church isn't. Now, if we're going to try to parallel then this to the Adventist church, and we're going to parallel this to 1919. The Adventist church is influenced by Protestantism, but the Adventist church is not Protestantism. The Adventist church is not Babylon. It's the Adventist church. We could even parallel this to other periods of time in which the Jews were infected or affected by uh, Greek thought that doesn't make the Jewish church, uh, a pagan church, and it doesn't make the Jewish church Babylon. 
um, there's an influence there that was happening that was affecting the Christian church and hindering them, but it wasn't something that, that characterized the true church. They're not pagan. They're not doing practicing pagan rites, but they're influenced by these ideas, the thoughts and the ideas of paganism surround them. So um, he says, on the other hand, the city where the exchange of sit, uh, takes place, it talks about the Nicolaitans, and that, of course, is in Revelation 2.15. So the Church of Pergamos uh, has this uh, reference to the Nicolaitans. And this would be a type of um, belief um, that has uh, the idea that Jesus is just a man. Um, I believe that's the Nicolaitans. Uh, there's another type, Gnosticism, which would make Jesus like completely spiritual. So there's these different teachings. Um, and I'm not certain about the Nicolaitans. Um, I used to know, just can't remember now. Now, um, and of course we know that this is the time when they think to change times and laws. So we know that Constantine's going to bring in this period, the first Sunday law. And, and this is a long period. So Pergamus is going to go all the way here from 313, when they're accepted, all the way up to 538. And, and so we see all this power that's going on, but it's ultimately the papacy. So first, Constantine recognizes Sunday. Or, or Yeah, so he recognizes Sunday as the Sabbath. But we're going to later see that the power that's going to enforce this um, is the papacy. So that's going to be under Thyatira. Now, just seeing how much time we have here. Okay, so we've got a bit of time to go through these verses. So I'm going to skip back here uh, to the Bible, just on its own. Now, so we have this, they're on this ship, and uh, they're now experiencing this opposition. And, and the question is, where are we going to end this? Like, when is the storm going to occur? That's going to be verse 13. So if we're, if we're going to try to look at this line, um, I'm going to draw it. I'm going to try the best that I can to, to sort of illustrate this. So I haven't drawn it yet, so I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. Other than, you know, we have this line, and we have... Uh, this step. So we're going to have, we're going to put it on a line. We have a period of darkness. And so a period of darkness is going to uh, precede this. Now, this is about a journey from Paul of Paul going to Rome. And so obviously this period of darkness would be uh, symbolic of, of, because a reform line always addresses what the darkness is. Now this darkness is this rejection of the gospel uh, by Felix and, and, and others. And now Paul is uh, being charged and he's going to be sent to Rome to be tried. So this is going to be this journey and this increase of light, which we always have. So we call this the time of the end when he leaves uh, Caesarea, um, Marinarius or whatever it's called. And there's going to be this increase of light. And we know that uh, we have the first, second, and third angels' messages that are going to be given. And this first message, um, this increase of light, is about this journey. And we know that we have three people involved. Er, Aristarchus, Paul, and Luke. And um, as they're going to go on this journey together, just like the first angel's message has, fear God, keep his commandments, uh, and the hour of his judgment has come. So fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. That's what it says. So fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And that symbolizes all the three messages. And we can see here that these three are symbolizing those messages. And now we're also saying that these three are going to be the priests, which we're going to deal with. And then there's going to be these other people on the ship that are going to be the Levites. Now, in this first part of this journey, we have to decide where the storm begins. And if I was going to parallel this with the reform lines that we have, 
we're going to have the storm begin after the empowerment of the message. Now the storm, if we're going to mark it here, I'm, I'm just going to go Millerite history, August 11th, 1840. Right? So August 11th, 1840 is Islam, which is a wind. Now this wind, we're going to study the storm. We're going to see that basically in my view, that this is referring to this history, to this time period. Now, of course, we can always parallel this time period with our time period, which, I'm, which is what we're going to do ultimately. But if we can just look at this here, this period of time is this increase of light. They're traveling from a place and they're going to have this uh, empowerment, let's say, of the message. And that's what the that storm is going to represent, an event that's going to empower this, that message. And I, and I hope that just you know, it's pretty simple, and, and, but I don't know if I have lots of support, uh, you know, trying to deal with what this journey is about. They're trying to get somewhere, and we're just taking the, these, this, these three people who are traveling on this ship, and uh, once they get onto this new ship, and I would say that the new ship now, and that's where I have... So we have this ship of Alexandria, right? So here they're going to be first be on the ship of that, uh, that, uh, uh, that travels up along the coast, and then they're going to get onto this new ship. And, and the question is, how would we put this in this line? Um, we, we put it in our other line, so we're going to put it in an, uh, other lines as well. But here, even in this part, Alexandria even though it can be symbolized as Egypt and uh, education and so forth, it can have other symbols because symbols can have more than one meaning. And I would say that this would formalize in this idea, it would be the formalization of the message in 1833, if I was gonna just put it in this line. That this, this, they're doing this journey, but when they get onto this ship, they now have a different ship to travel on. And, and that ship, is what's going to carry them to their destination. And if you look at Millerite history, Miller is going through an experience here where he's, he gets his concordance. He's eventually gonna go through a, a battle. Um, and then that battle, he's gonna be convicted that God is real and cares about us. And then he's gonna start a period of Bible study. And by 1818, he's gonna have an idea of when he thinks the 2300 days and the 2520 and the 1335 are going to end. And then at some point he changes ship. And, and that ship then would be the ship of Alexandria. And it's not necessarily a bad thing in this context, right? So it depends where you put it in that context, because this is just a formalization. This is about knowledge or education. And he's now going to start teaching other people about this understanding that he has. So that's another way we can look at it. We can look at it in the way that this author has. Yes, Stephen, any thoughts on that? Well, Alan White calls it a good ship. Right. Yeah, it's a good ship. So thanks for that, because I, I was, I remember reading that and thinking about that. So this is a good ship. So even though we, we you know, and this is the thing is that Tess was looking at this negatively um, for the most part. And, and he is here too. But Ellen White said it's a good ship. And that is, there's, this is the organization. Another way we can look at it is as Adventists, we all understand the idea you gotta stay with the ship. What is the ship? Ship is the church. And it has to do with the organization. And you're gonna see how this is gonna apply as we put it into this movement. So now we have a good ship. We have the ship of Alexandria. And this ship is gonna carry us to our journey. But there's a, there's a lot of trials that are going to be gone through to get to that journey. Now, in this journey, we're, we're then going to argue that, you know, October 22nd is that journey, 1844. And this is going to symbolize the Sunday law. Um, so, you know, we're just putting this down here just to sort of give us the idea that somehow in this formalization of the message, which I would place here, that then they're going to hit this storm. And this storm, of course, we have Islam, but it's not about Islam. This initiates something else. It initiates a growth in this movement that's going to cause opposition, right? 
So what ends up happening here after that foundation is laid and then the first angel's message is empowered, then they're going to, uh, because this is the foundations, then they're going to have, I can't remember the word that we always use it for. I think it's just uh, the work of the enemies. So we're going to see the work of the enemies in here in this history from August 11th, 1840. And it's going to, it's going to grow, of course, uh, because in here in this history, once he starts you know, publishing papers, you're going to have ministers uh, writing papers and theologians writing papers and opposing him. Uh, and then finally to the point where the Protestant churches will shut the doors to the Millerites as we get closer uh, to the end of these prophecies. So any thoughts on that? That's as far as I want to go today. Um, and because I want you to think about it in the next day before we go to the storm itself and try to see how this applies. And, and as you can see, I'm doing a different idea than him. I could go back and look at the ideas that he has um, dealing with the seven churches. And I, I don't think he's wrong. So I think that you could apply it that way. There's good reasons because this is about Paul and Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. And you can look at the sea as being the Gentiles and all these types of things. But I think that we could primarily place this in Millerite history. And then more specifically, we can then create the parallel with our history. I think it's going to be easier to do that, to do it with this, with the priests, with, the, with our line. Any, any thoughts on this? Is this being helpful at all? Yes, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is this, okay. <laughs> Anybody see any? First time I would have looked at it like this, sir. Okay. Okay. What's that? It's the first time I would have looked at it this way, so okay. for me, it's, yeah, first time. Okay. Um, and in, any, any obvious errors that I'm making? I mean, if you, if you don't want to tell me in person here, you can always email me with what you think is an obvious error. And, and I don't know if I expressed myself well, but I think, you know, we can see it's a journey. Um, and we have to then decide in what scale it is and where we could best apply it and where it's going to give us the most light. Because as, as I've made the case, and I, and I only have a slight idea about it, like I'm not 100% certain about exactly where we're going to end up. But it seems to me, from my study of this, is that it actually tells us that we fail in our prediction. That's where we're going to go to. We're going to see why we failed. And I think Acts 27 is going to give us that answer. And it will tell us where we are and what it is we're supposed to do. That's, that's my, my thesis, um, but it's incomplete still because I still think there's pieces of the puzzle that I don't have to, you know, if I couldn't just tell you right now, here's why I think that. I mean, I could tell you, but you would say, well, what's your reasons, right? What's your support? And, and, and that's where I don't want to just, uh, um, you know, just have speculation. I want to have good support. Now, Angela had made uh, uh, a statement earlier uh, in, in, uh, in the group chat. Uh, I read Crete full of light, which would align with the empowerment of the message. And the grain laden ship could represent vessels carrying God's people and the word. And I would specifically say the word. So a, a grain laden ship, this, we know that this is the seed of the word. And, and this is this message that William Miller had, is that this was a light, full of light, and it was um, the ship uh, full of truth. And, and that would compare to his casket. And, and, and that's where we're really, you know, one of the things that, here, I'll, I'll try to say this in a way that, uh, um, even though I don't have, a lot of support for it, but it's sort of my, my conclusion to some, to some degree, is when we look at William Miller's dream, we know that there was these precious truths that were scattered, uh, that spur spurious truths, jewels and gems were mixed and all this dirt and they were trampled upon. And we know that the dirt brush man came in, in this history and has cleared away all the rubbish and now he has set these things in a casket. And 
and it's going to shine 10 times brighter. Now, I believe that that was completed on July 18th. Now, so that's a pretty bold thing to say because people don't see it. They said if we could see it was 10 times brighter, then you know, we, should, we, we should have seen it. But I think we can see it. I just don't think that we have the eyes to see it yet. And, but we will see it. Now, one of the things about the 10 times brighter that struck me um, is that when you're talking about a nuclear attack, a nuclear bomb, that's often the description of how bright a nuclear explosion is, that it's 10 times brighter than the day. There's even a song called The Pride of Man, uh, which I shared on Facebook. Um, uh, it was written by a Christian. It was done by some folk artists in the 60s. Um, but it talks about this, this city being destroyed and that with this uh, light that's 10 times brighter than the day. And so this 10 times brighter, to me, just becomes this symbol of, of July 18th, because that's what we expected was this nuclear attack. And I think that if we start to recognize that this line is typical, the line of the priest is typical, and that we shouldn't have expected an actual nuclear attack to occur on that day, but that a symbol of it, and to understand what that symbol is, I think that we fail to recognize the symbolism that was attached to what we were doing. We were looking for something literal. And, and of course, we couldn't do anything else than look at something literal because of how we saw our lines. And yes, the Pride of Man song mentions the towers falling, uh, which presaged the, um, the, the, the WTC, the World Trade Center destruction at 9-11 also. Yeah, so, so it's an interesting song, almost prophetic um, in, in how it, it connected both this destruction of the city and the falling of the towers and this light that shines 10 times brighter than the day, this destruction. So, so I think that there's good reasons why, and, and I still think that the problem is, is a misunderstanding of what our line is. And, and, and we're going to go through that, you know, in some other studies, because we've already done it. But I think once we go through Acts 27, I think we'll have a better idea of how to, to understand our line. And, and that's part of the problem that we had, is that we had a misapprehension of the line. This paper, this writer, contains that same misapprehension, this idea, you know, of this church triumphant and what it actually meant uh, what he thought it meant and what it compared to what it actually means. And um, raffia, the purpose of raffia, what we were expecting at raffia. And we should have learned there. We should have seen. Instead, we tried to, to pass the error off to the new movement. But what we didn't recognize is that we had exactly the same premise as they did in, in when, we, um, when we continued on. We didn't separate the precious and the vile as clearly as we should have. And, and many people thought the problem was time setting. And the problem wasn't time setting and it isn't time setting in the way that we did it. In the way that we did it, we were measuring the time in itself. And uh, this is important because after the time passes, then we could see what it was. So we shouldn't have been predicting an external event, but we should have still been measuring the time. We should have still looked at those dates because now we can look back and we can see just like the Millerites did, we were doing something wrong, contrary to scripture, but yet we were doing something right. And the problem was in some of our premises. So that's where I want to finish off. Uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, uh, as we continue on this study, I know there's some people who probably wanted to be here today. They can watch the video later. Um, but I think as we, we unfold, as unpackage uh, Acts 27, we'll be able to see the same thing, I'm hoping. So any final comments on this? Well, this morning I was trying to look up all those place names. I couldn't find one for Pamphylia, but I was thinking Pan and Phyllis could mean all love, like love for all, all nations. Yeah. I, I'll. And I'll I'll look it up. 
and try to see if I can figure it out. Yeah, I, I looked up a few and I, I'm trying to fit them into what you're saying, like this stage, stage of the church, era of the church, what did this mean according to the names of the places that they stopped? Yeah, and, and I know I'm being, um, you know, a little bit like we're zooming in and zooming out and just kind of jumping around in our relationship to how to fit this line in. But what we're saying is that the line fits in different places, right? So we can put it to the seven churches if we want. We can zoom it into Millerite history, uh, but we can also apply it to our history. We could even probably do the span from Miller to the end of the world. We could probably do it in different ways. Um, but I think the names here, like having the name of Crete mean full of light, I'm thinking about the ship vessel, and it's a good ship, and it's filled with wheat, with grain. So that's a good thing. And, and, and so we need to recognize that. But it can also represent paganism, right? It can represent, in, in a different line, it can have a different symbol. Um, but I, I still preferred the idea that it's a good ship. And that this is, uh, to me, I would much more prefer aligning this up with Millerite history than I would to go back to 34 AD, even though I don't think that's wrong. I just think that it's, it's a different application. So thanks, everyone. Okay, you have a comment, uh, Dwight? Yep. Are you, are you saying Millerite history from 1840 to 1844 or from 1842 to 1844? Um. Well, I'm saying Millerite history from 1798 to 1844 is our primary application. That's, our, that's, that's where I would place this. I was asking if this would be more in line with that of the seven thunders. That's right. That's. Right. I would put it more in line with the sealing up of the seven thunders. And in our history, we would then take what, how it applied to Millerite history, and then we would understand it in our context. So we'd go to 1989 and parallel it. That's the way I'm doing it. Okay. It is, so I know it's different. Um, different people have done it different ways. But to me, Millerite history is always our template because it's the one that gives us the key to understanding all the other templates that existed in the Old Testament. We didn't understand them as reform lines until we understood the Millerite reform line. Right. They were there all the time. Nobody just ever saw them. And once we started understanding Millerite history, that is, once the seven thunders were being unsealed and we were understanding the events in Millerite history, then we could actually look back and see the reform lines in the past. But it's still, to me, the primary reform line that unseals, even though it's sealed up, but it's the unsealing of that that gives us an understanding of all reform lines, is the Millerite reform line. Okay, yeah, the the entire point that I was asking, if we if we look at this more in line with the seven thunders, I think we're going to find the clarity that we're we're looking for. In, in, instead of the seven churches, you're saying. Correct. Yeah, and now I don't remember if you read my paper on the seven thunders, or, or saw the presentations on it. But one of the differences I had with the seven thunders from how we used to look at it is that in the past we looked at the seven thunders as as events in millerite history but the understanding i have is that those events were sealed up by seven thunders and that it's the unsealing of the seven thunders in our history is actually the unsealing of each of those events and so when a thunder is unsealed it's when we understand an event in Millerite history and how it relates to us in the present. Because as we pass over that ground of Millerite history, it unseals that event. And we can't actually understand the seven thunders, what they sealed up. That is, the, the Adventists in the, after Millerite history sort of felt that they understood the seven thunders. Right? They, they sort of thought that it was sealed up, and what was sealed up was their disappointment, and now we know what the disappointment was. But I think that the seven thunders were not unsealed until our history, once we repeated Millerite history. Um, right. So as we pass through those events, then we understand the events of Millerite history. And it's my contention that when we pass through July 18th, 
that the seventh thunder was then unsealed. And we were looking at it as being the unsealing of the seventh thunder. But what we now experienced was the disappointment. And it's that disappointment that is the key. And we had to experience that disappointment if we were going to understand Millerite history. And that's why I don't like people setting dates in the future, because then they say they're really telling me they don't understand Millerite history and they don't understand the significance of July 18th. They're dismissing it. It would be like the Millerites saying, well, October 22nd, 1844 was the right event, but the wrong time. And so I just need to look to another date, 1847. But now people are doing the same thing with July 31st. And I think that's a mistake. That's, that's my view. Because then we're not understanding what happened on July 18th. And I think Acts 27, by comparing this and looking at this closely, we will see that um, some of these things that we were applying to the past in Acts 27 are actually applying to July 18th. And, and, and we didn't see that before. So now we can see that. Okay, so thanks. Thanks for that, that uh, comment. That's really helpful. Okay, so we're going to close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the time that we have to study. We know, Lord, that uh, there's so much in your word, it's beyond human comprehension. And we have asked for your Holy Spirit to be here, to guide our minds, guide our study. And we have felt that this is the case, that we see things much more clearly than we did before. And we ask, Lord, that you can be with us as we think about these things throughout this day and uh, we come together tomorrow morning, uh, we ask Lord that uh, you can even uh, make things shine brighter, correct any error that we may have, uh, forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you. Uh, we pray for the things that we have to do ahead of us and um, we know Lord that it's more than we can bear. And so we just ask for your strength and power that comes from the study of your word. Be with each person here and those watching this video. And um, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.